we find this to be among the most helpful of activities in terms of self-awareness and, and so on. And we'll go through step by step in this whole process. I'll say process because that's where the majority of the world is. I would say process. Um, and the, the activity seems to have such a breadth of capacity for helping people in virtually any stage of life and virtually any culture. And I say any culture because uh, it's been translated into multiple languages. Uh, I've used it at least in probably a dozen different countries myself. And it seems to be appropriate. That's one of the questions that often comes. Uh, who, who can take this? Who will be able to profit from it? Um, the history of the uh, activity uh, goes back to a fellow by the name of Pierre Case or Kass, C-A-S-S-E, accent grave. Uh, he was a senior trainer at the World Bank. When he came on board, the World Bank was, was quite relatively new, quite new, and they were experiencing a lot of conflict between people, and particularly the nationalities that were there. And the conflicts produced a lot of friction, a lot of dysfunction in the organization. And they brought Pierre on to help them to understand each other. What were the causes of the conflict? And how do you resolve conflicts in these kinds of situations? So Pierre created an activity, or actually some worksheets, which we have turned into an activity. And I've had several workshops with Pierre myself, so um, kind of got it from right from the beginning. One of the things that happens is as a result of this activity, it helps us to understand ourselves and others better. And I'm going to get into that more in just a minute. But I've used it in marriage workshops, premarital training and counseling, boards of directors, hospital staffs, uh, NGOs, um, just about every kind of a situation, boards of directors, faculties of universities. We're bringing it to you because we think it'll help you in the managing of your teams and the training of your teams. And one of the things you need to know is we're going to give you all the information that, you, that you're going to receive here so, and train you in how to use it so that if you decide to use it, if you find it beneficial, you'll be able to take it back into your environment and hopefully uh, help people, help yourself, help everybody to live together, to communicate more effectively, and most importantly, to understand the other person so we can change our way of doing things so that we can better serve them. Often we use information as power to change the other person. This is information as power to change ourselves so that we can better serve the people that God has brought in to our environment and under our influence. My history with Duane is um, I was a student of Duane's uh, 30 years ago at a place called Wheaton College. I don't know if you've heard of Wheaton College, but it's just outside of Chicago. You know, our most famous alumni was Billy Graham. And so he was uh, the person who put Wheaton College on the map. But anyway, so Dwayne and I have this history. So I was, his, I was a student, and, um, and then uh, he hired me at Wheaton College, and I started teaching leadership 22 years ago under his direction. But in the meantime, I also did a, a, a PhD, and he was my first reader. And one day I was struggling with, with a, a certain paragraph, actually it was three sentences in my dissertation on leadership. And um, I called Dwayne up one day and I said, Dwayne, I said, I'm struggling with this. I just can't quite get these three sentences correct. And I'm talking to him on the phone and I hear this burst of laughter. And I said, what's so funny? And he says, listen, you need to relax. He said, there's only three people in the world who will ever read your dissertation, and I'm one of them. <laughs> so he put me in my place, and from that point forward, we've been you know, friends and colleagues, and we've done many things together and enjoy each other's friendship. Um, so as I said, I, I've actually been teaching leadership at Wheaton College for 22 years. Um, the, the test that we're going to do with you all in, today, um, as Dwayne said, we've probably given it between the two of us well over 20 or 25,000 people. We've done it on every continent. So Africa, Asia, South America, North America, and universally, um, it has been uh, very well accepted, very well uh, appreciated. But in my, in my, with my colleagues at Wheaton College, you know, one of the things they, they often tease me about is that leadership is a soft academic study. It's not like theology or biology or chemistry or English. Um, it's, it's perceived as being a little bit soft. 
And it's interesting, that's really not an accurate assessment of leadership. Um, uh, it actually has a, a, a very much of a, a research base to it. Right after World War II, there was a professor at the University of Southern California, which is one of our very uh, most highest regarded universities in the United States. And a man by the name of Warren Bennis was curious as to why the outcome of World War II was what it was. Because if you looked at the war, and, and in terms of the, the buildup and what began in 1938, 39, 40, is that, is that the Allied forces had the same number of tanks and soldiers and airplanes and ships as the Axis countries did. And yet the outcome um, obviously ended up you know, with, with the Allies you know, prevailing. So he, he, he focused on you know, what is it that, that was the difference maker in the, the, the war and why did you know, one side prevail over the other? And his conclusion was it wasn't a matter of tanks and ships and soldiers and, and guns, but it rather was an issue of leadership. So what, what he did, what Warren Bennis did, is he studied the whole area of leadership and he, and he interviewed people in, in the academy and in business and in education and in the sciences. And what he came up with was, was that there are 88 characteristics that make someone an effective leader, 88. And then he said this is the reason why one, air, one set of countries prevailed over the other. Well, 88 were, were, was a, too large a number to really to, to be helpful. So he took those 88 and he found cl sort of clusters of ideas. And he came up that there were, there were four common characteristics that made someone an effective leader. Again, this is based on his interviews after World War II. So what do you think those four would be? As you think about there, you think about your role as leaders, what do you think would be uh, the four most important characteristics of making someone an effective leader? What do you think? Humility. Humility? Certainly that's got to be a part of it. Character. 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 Vision. Vision. Communication. Communication. I think some of you read this guy's research because that's about what he said. <laughs> so here's, what he, here's what, he, what he came up with. He said he took those 88 characteristics of what made someone an effective leader and he said it really comes down to four things. And the first one was vision the ability to sort of see the unseeable, the ability to look forward into something that didn't maybe exist, but being able to see something that someone else couldn't perceive. I always think of, for example, uh, um, you know, our, our iPhones, our, our, our smartphones. You know, what was it that caused Stephen Jobs to, to, to say, you know what, one day we want a, a, a device that we can take pictures with, we can access the internet, we can find out the weather reports and the stock prices, and we can also make a phone call. That's what vision is. So that was the first characteristic. The second one that Warren Bennis identified was uh, integrity or character. The idea that I live out what I say I believe to be true. In other words, there's a connection between my belief and my behavior. That's called character. Uh, the third one was self-awareness. The idea that I have a good sense of who I am. I know what my strengths are. And I also know what my limitations are. And a, a realistic assessment of who I am. It's called self-awareness. And finally, the last uh, characteristic that he identified was then the ability to communicate clearly. So if you can't speak it well, oftentimes your vision gets lost in the translation. So these 88 characteristics he was able to distill down into four things. Vision, integrity, self-awareness, and communication. And today what we're going to really do is really focus on those last two, this idea of we're going to help you understand better who you are and then how you communicate who you are to someone else, but also how you understand who, someone who's talking to you. So it's really this whole idea of who am I and how am I perceived and how do I perceive others and how do I bridge that gap between who I am and who they are. Because if leadership, in fact, is distilled down to those four characteristics, we must have the skills necessary to do that well. And that's what we're going to be doing this morning. What we're going to talk now about, what we're going to talk about now is why is it valuable to understand the various communication styles that exist. And in a few minutes we're going to find out that there are five of them. They seem to be universal in nature. And by understanding these, they give us certain benefits. 
they provide certain value or value added for us as we engage in relationships. So let's take a look at those. Um, the, first, uh, the first one is the ability to know ourselves. Uh, most of us think we do know ourselves, but one of the things we're going to discover is how we knowing ourselves help us to understand the clustering of values around our particular communication style. What kinds of things that we gravitate towards, but what kinds of things we move away from, or what kinds of people we tend to move away from. And this is called emotional intelligence. It's the ability to monitor what's going on in your mind and in your feelings. And in knowing that, you can then be able to more effectively control the, the, those thoughts and those feelings so that you can maximize the relationship. If you don't control those, you're a victim to your feelings and a victim to your thoughts, and often that creates dysfunction, if not damage to the relationship. All right, so the, the first aspect is to know ourselves, and that's what's called uh, emotional intelligence. What are our values? How do we make decisions? Uh, how do we affect others? What limitations do we have given the way in which I think, feel, and uh, see myself? And then what's our place on the team, but also in the body? I've taken tons of these kind, I mean, not quite tons, but a lot of these tests. This one best serves my understanding of what it means to be church, what it means to be koinonia in fellowship, what it means to be in the body, what it means to value differences and to understand what I bring and what other people bring so that if we all bring together, there's a wholeness that emerges in our midst. I can't bring wholeness, that's not who I am, nor can you. But together, we can help each other become more whole. The second is to know ourselves. This is the issue of uh, social intelligence. Now, I, I've never been particularly good at this, and it's the ability then to read the nonverbals and the cues that you're picking up from the other person. My wife is phenomenal at this, and I've watched her. We walk away from talking with somebody, and, and she will say, boy, they're having trouble. I'm saying, what? They never, t uh, what do you, what's going on? I, and sure enough, a week later, we find out things are troubled. She has, th these people kind of have this antenna up here, and they pick up signals that the rest of us, well, our antenna's broken. That's probably what happens. So to know ourselves, to see the best rather than the worst. So we're going to look at the other styles of communication in addition to our own. And they all have some beauty, but they all have some limiting factors. We're going to take a look at those. Perhaps the most important thing in marriage, cross-cultural relations, leading a team, is to suspend judgment. Um, well, if we have time, we'll talk about negative attribution, which means when people do something different, we tend to assign them a negative attribute because they're not like us. If they're not like us, they must be defective in some way. Now, maybe you don't have that problem, but a lot of people do. Given our differences from one another, how do we learn? If God has made people different, it means none of us has our life and our reality all together. And so by learning what God has placed in his people and learning from them, we can become more whole, more complete, more well-informed. And then to serve them, not from my frame of reference, but to serve them from your frame of reference. One of the great challenges of being a leader, seeing where they're coming from, serve them in their context, their frame of reference. And then to affirm and to value the diversity and the differences that exist within us. Then number three, how do we build bridges? And this is called relational intelligence. So now if I, if I have greater understanding of myself and I can monitor what's going on in myself, and I are able to I'm able to detect the kinds of things that you're bringing, I picked up elements in your tone and your nonverbals and what you're telling me. Now how do I adjust so that this conversation can be fruitful rather than you know, sort of starting to butt heads or starting to change the other person or try to correct them. And now here is the strength of the leader, the ability to adjust expectations. By the way, every time you have frustration 
or feel anxiety, it's because some expectation is not being fulfilled. Think about that. So if we can adjust our expectations, it's an incredible power that we have then to control our environment in ways in which the Spirit of God can move and, and be in our midst. To be the relational intelligence meaning, means being less competitive and more cooperative in relationships. To be willing to change for the sake of the relationship, I adjust so that the relationship has a capacity to move forward, so that we can feel a sense of safety and openness and transparency with one another. To encourage and affirm the strength of others. Uh, one of the great, uh, great leaders have that capacity to identify what you do well and to tell you what you're doing well. And that buoys us, that strengthens us to continue and to be positive. And then to proactively and sensitively engage others. So those are our, our goals. The, uh, the kinds of things that we're about in this workshop. Uh, any questions before we move on? It boils down to two objectives for today. How to raise our emotional intelligence, our social intelligence, and our relational intelligence. And then how do we use this to help build our teams? How do we use it to help build our marriages? How do we use it to strengthen our relationship with our children? or our parents. Uh, you, there are virtually no boundaries of which this cannot be helpful to us in our time together, in our time as we move away from this conference. As we get into this activity, I want to clarify some assumptions for us. And uh, after, I've, I've, uh, after we've gone through this, we'll give you a handout for this as well, so you don't have to take notes on it. The first assumption is everyone scores something on each of the four styles. Actually, there are five styles, and that's, there's a fifth style, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it makes this uh, activity somewhat unique. I don't know of any other test that allows for this fifth, tile, fifth, fifth style to uh, exist, and for maybe about a third of you, that's gonna be good news. Um, every once in a while, people score zero on a uh, particular style, and if they do, it means that they have a strong Latin, they, they have no preference for engaging in that style or that set of values at all. And we'll come back and you'll, you'll understand that more. The higher the style, the higher the score, the greater the commitment to that style. Now high begins around 16. Uh, the, the highest score you'll have will be 20, and then it goes down to zero, as I indicated. But when you get into a score of about 16, it means that you have a very strong commitment to that particular style, and that will make sense as soon as you um, get your scores. The lower the score, the lower the comfort in using it. So if you score a, a low begins around six or so, and again, I'm saying I'm kind of fudging on the things because it's a gradation. It's not all of a sudden you cross a line and this is good and this is less good. It's that you have more and more commitment or you have less and less a commitment. So the lower your score, the less commitment you have to that style and the more you're unlikely to engage in activities or to cluster around people who, have, who are like that lower score. That is, you tend to avoid things. Furthermore, the area of your lowest score is where you tend to find stress, okay? Makes sense, doesn't it? Because they're just connecting in ways that doesn't really connect with your values, connect with how you do things, how you think about things. And then people use different styles at different times. Uh, there's five styles, uh, four, and you'll see how we can move back and forth as we walk through that in a minute. Circumstances can change your scores for short periods of time. So for example, um, one of the things we'll discover is that people have a certain style, they don't like details particularly. So we've just come through in the last couple of weeks tax season in America and you've got to fill out these ridiculously detailed kinds of things and you have to document everything and it all has to be very crisp and right and, 
And if you're not a detailed person, this just drives you crazy. And so you put things off and you avoid it or you try to pay somebody else to do it. On the other hand, you, uh, you, you can just bear down and do what you don't like to do. We can't always do the fun stuff, right? You can't always have vacation. You've got to work. So um, we move into these areas and we get the job done, but then we move back into something that's more comfortable. And usually we bounce back into something more comfortable and try to dwell there because that just is where everybody ought to be. Where I'm, If I'm comfortable there, everybody should be comfortable there. So circumstances kind of require us to change and make adjustments. My wife scored very high on, on people values, and then she did her PhD uh, dissertation and classes where if you have too much time with people, you don't pass your courses. You, you spend too much time at the parties, you're not going to get the papers written. And so she had to make adjustments there for the years that she was in her program. Now, the last one, uh, second to the last one, everyone is a composite of all the scores. You'll, you will probably have a highest score, or you might have two or three or even four somewhat equally high scores. All of those are okay. It doesn't matter what your scores are. That's who you are. That's what's cool. This is your reality, and that's good. So don't think in terms of good and bad. It's just not there. And don't think in terms of just one category, because I don't want to be known as by one category. I grew up in my early days. Uh, there was the phlegmatic and the choleric, and what were some of the others? Any? Sanguine. Melancholic, yeah, yeah. My mom had me pegged. But in the test, I had three equally high, almost equally high score, but I think it was phlegmatic, I can't remember. But phleg one was one point higher. So my mom labeled everything I did in that category, which was not me. Never has been me, probably won't be. So keep in mind that the categories that we use that will grow out of our time today are like little windows, but the house behind those windows is far more complicated and far, it needs far greater understanding than just that window. But that window is what gives you some immediate vision about where that person is and it helps you to understand the rest of the pieces. Lastly, uh, under stress, people revert to their primary style. So everybody has a pretty um, predictable way of responding when they're under stress, and that's going to be something that we talk about towards the end of the program. Uh, there are five styles of communication as we talk about it. There's a cluster of values that cluster around each style, and uh, there's benefits and there's limitations to each style. So Dave, give us the... Uh, the first slide here. The first style that is listed on your sheet, style one, and you have a number there, that's called the action person or the action style. And you might want to put the word action next to it so that it's just there um, when you need it down the road. And the action person is concerned primarily with the question, what? I mean, that's just kind of a very simple way of thinking about this person. What needs to get done? What can I do? What's the agenda? Uh, what's on the, on the docket for today? And so they tend to be primarily concerned and their values seem to focus primarily on getting things done, achieving, and doing. Now that's just the broadest brush of understanding this person. The second style on your worksheet is called the process person. And the primary question for them is, how ought things to get done? What's the process by which we go from A to B and eventually uh, to the end of our goal? And the process person then is primarily focused or their values are primarily focused on strategies, on what we need to organize to accomplish this, on facts or data that are necessary for us to make good decisions. How ought we to get things done? The third style, and this would be number three then on your worksheet, is the people person. And their question is essentially who? 
Who will I be working with? Uh, who will be affected by what we do? Who will be involved uh, in making all of this happen? And their focus and their values tend to revolve around communicating, uh, oftentimes talking is the word there, on relationships, particularly good, smooth relationships, on teamwork, uh, the question of who. Then there's the fourth style, which is called the idea person. And the idea person is concerned about why. Yes, good to get things done. I mean, sure, that, that has to be part of life. How is also important. Nobody wants to get messed up on things. And who is going to be involved? These are all good things. But the real question, the real question says the why person is, why do you want to do this in the first place? Why is this the most important? Why should we give our time, our energy, our resources to this? And you'll be getting a handout on this in a minute. Now, that's style number four, but we said there were five styles, and this style is quite unique. It's called the blend person. Not to be confused with bland. Blend, okay, keep that there. The, the blend person is somebody who scores somewhat equally high on all four styles. So look at your four scores. And are they within three, there's the highest and the lowest within three points of each other? If so, you're a blend person, a four-part blend. Take a look at your three highest scores. And if they're within three points of each other, then you're a three-part blend. I'm moving away here because I want you to be able to, some of you are taking photographs there, so that's fine. Uh, you could be a three-part blend. Some of you have two equally high scores. It doesn't matter which combination. Uh, you would be a bimodal person. Now what that means is the four-part blend is somebody who moves somewhat equally in all four of these zones. Now you can understand that the blend person is often confusing to somebody who scores a 16 or an 18 on one particular style. Who are you? I mean, you're sometimes here, and you're sometimes here, and then you're over here, and then you're back there. Who are you? So blend people often have difficulty even in their own identity because very often we build a lot of our identity around our work world or around our values. But the communication person, uh, I'm sorry, the blend person tends to share all of these values but to a lesser degree. Um, but we're going to unpack these all in just a few minutes, so uh, don't, don't worry about the details here. Um, the bimodal person, let's say that you have these two as e somewhat equally high scores, uh, they tend to shift back and forth, so the circle would come very high here and very small in those areas. When organizations have a high scoring person, it doesn't matter what style it's in, if it's a high scoring person, then a committee is made to choose the next, the successor, the next person to take leadership. It's predictable. Whatever the limitations are of that person that's there now, the next person will have strengths in that area. So if it's a high action person, they'll say, what we've got to do is get somebody who is more sensitive to people. You know, We've got all of these things going on. But, or they'll say, we need somebody to get control and and manage this thing more. We're not sure what's going on. And so then they build the infrastructure, a process person would. So watch that in organizations. You tend to react to the limitations of the person that's, that's there already. The second thing I've discovered, um, and uh, this is, has to do with that when the leader is chosen by popular vote, okay? In that case, and usually it's a field leader, not the home office leader, uh, I'm speaking from my context now, the home office leader is generally chosen by a committee. Uh, in, leaders on the field in, in various locations are usually chosen by the vote of the people that are part of the organization. In that situation, one group, typically, one group is generally chosen, and that's the blend group. And here's why. The blend group identifies with everybody and everybody says, a little bit of me is in that person, and I like that. So it's either a two-part blend, a three-part blend, or a four-part blend that's chosen for leadership uh, on many of the fields. 
I did one mission group that had 27 people came home, 27 different fields leaders came home. Every one of them was either two, three, or four part blend. So popular vote, the blend has some advantage. That's not saying it's the right choice, but it's saying they have an advantage because of who they are. Uh, in committee choice, they often go with somebody who's going to compensate for the limiting factors of the other person. And we all have limiting factors, so that's, yeah. Uh, we probably need to make a transition. Um, what I'd like to do, though, in just 30 seconds is do something that was the last assumption up here. What, do, what does your group do under stress? And we, if we had time, we'd have you discuss that. But here's the, the quick and dirty answer. The action person under stress tends to become hyperactive. The process person under stress tends to withdraw, to analyze and to think about what went wrong and what we can do better the next time. So they need to be alone. They need to have space to think. The people person <clears throat> tends to uh, want to talk to a friend who will be able to understand their feelings and somebody who will empathize with them. Now, if the stress is great for the people person, uh, including men, there would, might be an explosion, uh, that usually tears or anger. Either of those can happen if, if the stress doesn't get resolved. For the, um, for the uh, idea person, they tend to withdraw into a world of fantasy. Uh, video games are the most common these days, but it could be a newspaper or a book, somewhere where life fits together, where things work out, where people really do the right thing. You know, we have so little of that in this world, <laughs> says the people, idea person. And then the blend person, who knows? <laughs> but they are predictable, because if they've been around people too much, they want to get alone or they want to get something done. Or you, so you do the opposite. Why? So that you bring more balance into your life. So whatever is going on, if you're in the process, you want to get out there and get something done. And that brings balance into your world. And so your str all of your stress is intended to bring balance, bring some sense of relief, getting back to equilibrium, getting back to the normal, whatever normal is for you. Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, I come home from work, um, and I'm, I'm actually a, a blend person for the most part, but uh, I come home from work, and my world has been a very process kind of world. I'm a process person, and uh, I've had a stressful day. What, what am I going to want to do to relieve my stress? Tell me. I want to I be alone. I don't want to talk to anybody. I've been talking to people all day, and that's why I've been frustrated and tense. So I want to be alone to think about how I lost control and how I get re control back tomorrow. My wife is a people person. What's she going to want to do taking care of the two young children, preschoolers and so on? What's she going to want to do as a people person? Talk. Talk. Yeah. So I come home and she says, how are you? I, you know, kiss and how, how was your day? And I said, well, it's really pretty bad. How was your day? She says, well, you know, the kids, they just were terrible today and so was, so was going to come over and then they, they didn't come. So I say... Great, great, great. And I make for a quiet place. But my wife says in her head, oh, he's had stress today. If I could only get him to talk about it. <laughs> she goes after me. So what happened in stress today? What caused it? Who was it? Was it somebody? I says, you know, don't worry about that. That's fine. I'll, and I keep moving away. And she says, oh, he's really stressed. We got to talk. <laughs> now, what is she, what's happening to me as she's trying to help me? making matters worse, right? In trying to help me, she worsens. She makes it more difficult for me. And so I turn around and I say, you know, I'm sorry. I, I realize you told me it was a difficult day for you. I'll tell you what, sit down at the table. I'll take care of the kids. You get this piece of paper and you write the things that stressed you today and what you can do to keep from being stressed tomorrow. And I'll give you a quiet place to do that. <laughs> now she's ready to, you know, like that. You insensitive, whatever. When we understand other people, we now know how to serve them in a way that they will feel served. Otherwise, we serve them from our frame of reference, 
and that becomes oppression. That becomes damage, and now you're both in damage control. So now that I understand you, I am free to change to serve you. That's what Christianity is all about. That's what shepherding is all about. One of the things that we try to do uh, that's very important for us is to help us not only to see ourselves, but to see others accurately. And to see them in such a way that we can now see what they need, see how they see the world, see what things are of value to them, see what preferences they might have. And so um, one of the ways of getting at this idea of perspective taking or perspectivism is uh, this work by Hertzberg from the Chronicle, uh, an American academic newspaper called the Chronicle of Higher Education. And um, he, when, when we were struggling with diversity on our campuses uh, long, quite a number of years ago, this appeared on the front page of this uh, periodical. And I thought it was just genius. Would you like to join me up here? What's your first name? Maris. Maris. Uh, leave your glasses on. And, and there, there's one of two possible things happening. Let's stand over here so everybody can see us. You do exactly what I do. One of the possibilities is that I'm taking my glass off, glasses off, and Marius is taking his glasses off, and we're putting it on the other person. Okay? What's the message if that's what's happening? I'm putting my glasses on him, and he's putting his glasses on me. What's the message? See the world through my eyes. Yeah, I want you to see what I see. I want you to see like I see. I want you to be like me. Okay, here's the other possibility. We are both interested in another option, and I'm taking his glasses off as he's taking mine, and I'm putting his glasses on my face. Now what's, what's the message now? I want to see the way you see. One is an egocentric, superior message. The other one is a serving message. Thank you. Okay. What Hertzberg is doing here is what's the serving message? How do we see like other people see? So now, looking at this, how do we, what's necessary in order for us to see as other people see? So humility requires... Humility allows for me now to believe that he can help me. And he has to have humility to believe that I can help him. That his insights, his the way he sees, will be beneficial to me. That requires humility. It also means that I don't have my world together. I don't see everything correctly. I don't have all there is. It's not about being wrong and right. It's mm -hmm. being different. It's about being different and seeing those differences and valuing those differences, all right? So humility, that's, that's a really good one. What else, what else is necessary here? Mutuality. Mutuality. If we're going to have some kind of a relationship, we both have to be doing this together. So the hand is on, my hand is on his, his hand is on mine. Mutuality has to be something we do together. And what happens when I put on the other person's glasses? I don't see very well for a while, right? But that's because it's a different perspective. Ideally, at least, my eyes will adjust to see what he sees as clearly as he sees. What else is going on here? Yeah, we're both visually impaired, so hopefully proximity. the glasses will improve. And proximity and togetherness, yeah. There has to be a closeness here. We can't do this by email. It's probably not going to happen. It has to be sitting down face to face, talking openly couple of other items. There has to be a trust. You don't share with somebody that you don't trust. You don't share anything important. So the trust has to be there. In order for trust to occur, in order for this transparency and this exchange to occur, it takes time. We have to continue to work at it. And there are times when misunderstanding will come, so the, we have to be patient. Are they the same height? Well, pretty. It's intended to be, I think. Okay. Yeah. What does what does a similar height and similar structure, physical structure, imply? They're equal. They're equal. Absolutely. If I see myself as higher than, or the other person does, if I see myself, 
that's going to be a barrier in what we're trying to accomplish here of understanding each other's world. When we understand each other's world, God is able to do so much more in terms of bringing value to his kingdom and revealing the nature of our God as the God who embraces all people. And ultimately, God's perspective on things is what both of us then can finally achieve. You, can, you have God's perspective, I have God's perspective. But if together we share perspectives, there's a good chance we get closer to God's perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a nature of what it means to be children of the King. Um, the reason we do this is because we want, if, if, if no other reason um, than to you know, help you with your, your own self-awareness, what we really want to do is reduce the level of conflict in the church. Um, and part of that is appreciating someone for who they are, knowing who you are, both your strengths and your limitations, but also appreciating the other person, this perspective taking. Um, rather than looking at someone who's different than you and uh, attributing some kind of negative attribution, um, we can look at someone and say, you know, you're different than I am, and that's good. Because to the degree that to which we can lower conflict and build unity, the church is going to grow. Jesus said, so, so Jesus gathers his disciples together for the very last time in the, in the Last Supper, and, and essentially he says this, he said, um, the world will know who I am by the way you love one another. I mean, to me, that's the strongest statement that Jesus ever made about evangelism. It wasn't the four spiritual laws. It wasn't the right kind of uh, environment or the right kind of food to serve. He said, the world will know who I am by the way you love one another. And how do we love one another? It's because we appreciate each other's differences. Not minimizing those differences or, or, or assigning some kind of negative attribution, but rather say, I'm glad that you're a process person or a people person. I appreciate that, and we need that in the church for the church to grow. For the church to grow, we've got to be united. It doesn't mean to be uniform. We don't all need to be the same, but we need to be united. And I think Paul so clearly addresses that in 1 Corinthians, the importance of the unity of the church. And that's what hopefully, besides some level of self-awareness that you've gained about yourself, um, but that you're able to sort of build <laughs> unity within the context of your, of your families and your teams and your churches and your organizations. And, and I think to the extent that we can do that, the kingdom of God will be built.